uh, is hearing me well. Um, hi everyone, this is Farida Thaqib again. Welcome uh, to the second episode of our latest web series, Beyond Year 3, held in partnership with the Jatma Foundation, Africa Netpreneur Prize, which we'll talk about more later during the session. Beyond Year 3 uh, web series aim to equip uh, founders in the third year of their entrepreneurial journey uh, and beyond to navigate the ongoing COVID-19 crisis effectively and to continue uh, their, um, to grow their impactful businesses successfully and effectively. Today we have a very interesting topic to discuss which revolves around building your startup team. Successful companies are never a one man or woman show. To thrive sustainably as a, uh, as a startup, uh, you need to learn how to hire the best people, help them develop into leaders, and keep them excited to work for you and your organization. In this webinar, we'll discuss what is organizational culture, how uh, to attract and retain the best talents for your organization, and how to use your leadership skills to protect, uh, to project, sorry, uh, confidence and security to your team during crisis. In this session, we have a very uh, special guest, Bilal El Magarbil, CEO and co-founder of Maxup which is an e-commerce platform that connects uh, brands to grocery and retailers and food retailers in Egypt. He has extensive experience um, in leading teams and leading businesses. He worked at, uh, as the GM for the famous ride hailing company Kareem, uh, where he led the launch of Kareem's new services in Egypt. Hi, Bilal. Hi, Farida. Zayk. How are you? All good. Uh, I'm really excited to know and to hear from you uh, today. We'd love to have this session as interactive as possible. So everyone who's uh, watching us on Zoom or on Facebook, you can leave your questions and comments in the comments section. Um, I'll leave you for 30 minutes and I'll be back to discuss the questions and answers. Um, Belal, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. How do you want me to start? Um, just introduce yourself and go ahead. The sure. floor. Yeah. So, um, hello everyone. Thank you guys uh, for joining. Uh, I really think uh, that uh, uh, the Jack Ma Foundation and uh, the African Entrepreneur Prize is, uh, uh, is a great way for, uh, for the continent in general uh, to start thinking uh, bigger uh, and start gaining uh, traction when it comes uh, to startups. It's one of the ways I think the the continent can leapfrog and catch up with uh, with the developed world uh, very quickly. So I think it's a great initiative, I'm, uh, and I'm very uh, happy to be of any help uh, and to participate in any capacity uh, in trying to support uh, the organization. So a little bit uh, about myself. My name is uh, Bilal Al Magarbil. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Maxab. Uh, if you guys haven't heard about us, we're a B2B e-commerce platform that connects the small uh, mom and pop shops directly to uh, food suppliers and we do manage uh, the entire supply chain uh, for them as well. Uh, before that, I used to, uh, to run Kareem here in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, joined uh, Kareem uh, before it was a unicorn. Uh, walked step by step with an organization that I really respect and love and see and saw how it evolved from uh, a small uh, team to pretty much uh, a global team of around 2,500 people uh, across the MENA region and Pakistan. Uh, and I'm very, very thankful for this experience. Uh, and that's, uh, that's pretty much uh, who I am. Uh, to get into the, the discussion of, uh, of this topic, uh, we're here today to talk a little bit about uh, culture and the importance of uh, culture in building any organization. Uh, and uh, first of all, guys, do not undermine culture whatsoever. Uh, yes, it's something uh, soft, but it's extremely, extremely important uh, to the productivity of the organization at large. So an organization with a healthy culture can produce much more with the exact same amount of people, with the exact same people, uh, if put in the right culture and mindset of, uh, of execution. 
So that's uh, that's uh, the importance of culture. And uh, the second thing we'll be talking about is talent and attracting the best talent. Because uh, I think uh, uh, the talent and the people you have are the ones that specifically the very first hundred people, I would say, in the organizations are the one the ones that set the culture uh, of your company uh, to start with. Uh, so talking a little bit uh, about culture, culture is not the, uh, the mission and vision and all these fancy words you find written on the wall uh, in your organization. Uh, it's actually how people act and think and take decisions. Uh, this is uh, what your culture is. So again, it's not what you will coin in terms of phrases and sentences, but it, it's what somebody that walks into your office will feel. Uh, and again, it's what goes through people's mind when they're taking decisions, right? Uh, is what I'm doing fitting, let's say, the max up culture, right? Uh, and what is the max up culture, for example, to start with? Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually, uh, what culture is in the organization again because a lot of people think when they put a clear mission and vision statements on the wall uh, that's how they're setting their culture no culture actually start it's, it's set by the people at the very top it starts at the very top uh, if you are running a company and you're extremely focused uh, on execution then this will transcend down uh, to your teams and it will become uh, a, a big part of the company culture. If you have uh, an open door policy where everybody can speak their minds without anybody on another side getting defensive, uh, that's your culture as well. Uh, so that's pretty much how I think uh, culture, uh, what culture is. So how, how do we go about building cultures uh, in the organizations? Uh, it's pretty much simple. Start by yourself, right? Uh, what do you want your organization culture to look like? What do you think, uh, what do you respect in this life? How do you go about doing your day-to-day -day business? Uh, these are the things uh, that goes through my mind uh, while I'm thinking about the, the company culture. Uh, and then I start thinking about, is this actually happening uh, on ground? Is our people uh, acting the way I would love them to act uh, is pretty much how do you measure uh, that uh, is, if your culture uh, is uh, is behaving the way and the manner uh, you want you want it to be. So I don't want to uh, to get uh, very deep into the culture element, even though it's um, it's I think again it's extremely important and it can be. Uh, one of the main drivers for producti your productivity on uh, in your organization, but it takes so much time to build. Uh, and I don't think a webinar uh, of 30 minutes or so would be able to cover uh, a big part of uh, how culture building happens. But what I really want to talk about today is, uh, is talent. Uh, how do you attract uh, the best talent? Uh, how do you keep them engaged? Uh, specifically in the time of crisis. I know that that's a broken record. We've been hearing so much about uh, how do you manage, how do you scale, how do you do whatsoever, how do you live, how do you survive in the times of uh, COVID-19 and uh, Corona. Uh, so I will talk about it a little bit more generic, disregarding uh, the current situation, uh, while just giving it a little bit of a, of a touch in terms of uh, uh, of what does it mean now and how cu culture and having the right people helps you to operate in extreme uh, time of crisis uh, like the ones uh, like the ones we have now so basically how do, how do you attract the, the 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 best talent the question is first of all very simple uh, the best talent lo love to solve big problems right so make sure you're working in a very a uh, tough problem that needs actually the best talent to come on board and fix it. So if you're doing more of the same uh, of any other, uh, what any other company is doing, I don't think that that's a good driver uh, for you uh, to attract uh, the best talent out there. Uh, the second thing is uh, 
do whatever it takes uh, to get them on board and always have the A type of kind of caliber. Because if you guys, if you hire the Bs, uh, the Bs will only hire Bs and Cs and Ds and you will get stuck uh, in that loop that is very hard uh, to break uh, later on. So I won't stress on the importance uh, of hiring fast and firing fast uh, enough. It's extremely critical because if you keep uh, the bad apples in your organization, they, they, mess, uh, they mess the good apples as well. So a very simple strategy is the right people on the bus, the, the wrong people off the bus as quickly as possible. Uh, and who are the right people? Who are the people that you want uh, on board uh, on that bus with you in this very painful long journey? Uh, right? These, uh, these are the people uh, that pretty much for me are the people that are extremely uh, bright uh, minds that want to so solve big problems. Uh, that, the, that see the values and are aligned with me on uh, on how, how we want to take this company forward and the big problem we are solving. Uh, again, a big problem is what gets everybody excited to start with and that's what uh, top talent I've seen uh, love and respect uh, more than anything. The, uh, the second part is pretty much treating them as equals because uh, they are uh, your partners uh, in this, regardless of the titles, everybody in the organization, your top talent, your management team, are your partners in, in, uh, in building this. So we have to listen to them exactly as equal. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's very helpful for them and for you uh, as somebody that are, are trying to manage uh, an organization and build an organization that is... Uh, still small and you want to grow it uh, from uh, a team to a tribe to a village to a continent uh, eventually uh, you have to treat the top talent as equals you have to listen uh, to what they say extremely carefully everything they say have you have to keep them involved in the decision making because uh, it is uh, their job as well, right? So uh, you cannot do everything on your own. You have to involve these uh, calibers. Uh, that uh, other than that, it becomes pointless to have them if you aren't going to listen to them, right? So that's a little bit on uh, on attracting uh, att attracting the best talent. Now, how how do you retain the best talent you attract? Is by keep, keep, keeping them engaged, making sure you're solving one hard problem after the other. Uh, so pretty much uh, you have to keep them engaged and you have to keep thinking forward, a little bit forward, uh, so that they can come on board and join you on your train of thought uh, in building uh, the company you are trying to build. Uh, now, in the time of, uh, of this crisis, uh, Leadership is uh, extremely important. A lot of people uh, uh, in this situation uh, suffer from whether they, we like it uh, or not. They're, uh, emotionally, everybody is extremely stretched to his, their limits. Uh, and people tend, uh, so a problem that big uh, in the time of Corona now will, will sound like it's that big just because everybody uh, is already uh, in uh, very, I'm sorry, I'm reading one of your questions. Okay, sure. Could you walk us through, Max? Should I answer the, the questions now or should it be at the end of the webinar? We can do it at the end of the webinar. Okay, sure. So, yes, so I was talking about uh, leadership in, in, uh, in the times of Corona. Uh, and I was just saying that uh, a problem that is that small, that, that small will feel like it's that big just because everybody is not close to each other. Nobody can picture what's going through. They cannot read your reactions. So they actually don't know if that's a big problem or a, or a small problem. So I would say communication is key 
uh, in general and specifically in the time of corona the the magnitude of it just got multiplied by by 4x uh, that's how important uh, communication is uh, in these times people are stressed out people are uncertain because these are uncertain times and your job is to pretty much uh, breach this gap and figure out ways uh, to bring the people together uh, talk to your people talk to your people about how they're feeling uh, their emotions how stressed uh, they are uh, in this uh, times and then you need to project confidence right uh, even if you are not very certain about uh, what the future entails we're hearing about allow about so many layoffs a lot of people are getting salary reductions and all these things these things are okay and they will happen and they used to happen before corona and they will continue to happen uh, but what's important uh, in these kinds of situations again is to stay super clear in communication uh, and to understand uh, uh, the emotional needs of your team uh, it's not my type of person at all that is very keen about to be frank and honest about people's uh, emotions when it comes to work but lately I've have figured out that uh, it's actually super important for, uh, for a manager or a leader to start and understand why are people behaving this way? What kinds of emotional situation uh, are they in now? Are they stressed? Are, are they not stressed? Are, are they certain? And are, are they not certain? And out of my calls with my colleagues over the past month, I figured out that everybody, including myself, is extremely uh worried from the situation at large it doesn't have to do have nothing to do uh with the job itself but it's uh, it's about the family you have that you're uh, you are you're fearing uh, about right it's about your colleagues that uh, that you respect a lot and you like a lot and fearing for their safety it's about uh our warehouse workers uh, and what does uh, this means for their lives for their paychecks what if we have to take hard measures, right? Uh, all these things are extremely critical and uh, you should address them and uh, work, on, work on them specifically in these uh, very crucial times. Uh, what else should we be talking about uh, today's... Uh, So I can uh, I can get back a little bit uh, to my favorite topic again and uh, uh, and the best talent and, and building the best teams. Uh, I would want to add to what I've uh, I've just said that uh, everybody that will come into your organization uh, they have done their own experiences before they came with uh, with their own culture. Uh, and people tend to do whatever uh, they think is right uh, if everything is not uh, in a single place. If you do not communicate uh, what's important uh, for your culture and what, do, uh, what does your organization respect about people and what does it, uh, does it want the people, how does it want your people to function uh, is extremely important. So. As much as I've mentioned at the very beginning of this conversation that uh, the culture is, uh, is not uh, the mission and vision that you write on the wall. Uh, thus, on another note, no, it is what uh, people think when they walk into your office and what people think when they're taking action. But that doesn't uh, uh, negate the idea of writing these things on the wall, right, and making uh, you just have to practice what you preach. You just have to do them, right? There's no point of having them on the wall if you're actually, these are not the four things, for example, that comes to people's mind whenever they need to take a hard decision or whenever uh, they need uh, to make uh, a critical hire uh, in the organization. Uh, so yeah, so having these things written somewhere so that people can refer to, uh, is something also that is uh, extremely important as well. 
So uh, excuse me if I'm a little bit tired. You guys can imagine uh, the fasting and uh, we're actually uh, operating uh, 24 seven. Uh, and we're, uh, we're selling people's food at the end of the day. So we cannot, uh, uh, so uh, we, we have to keep operational. So it's been a, a couple of, uh, of super uh, stressful weeks. Uh, but let me uh, start uh, and take some of your questions as well. Uh, so we get this uh, to be more interactive and I don't fall asleep in the middle of it. Um, I feel you, I feel you, Abilail. Thank you so much for your insights. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, someone is asking, could you walk us through Maxab's culture in a bit of detail? And are you hired now? And what type of talent are you targeting? So actually he's asking three questions in a one, but let's start okay. by uh, answering what's Maxab's uh, culture. Okay, so let me act, uh, actually answer them in reverse uh, order. So I'll answer the last part of the question uh, first. What type of talent are we targeting? Uh, it's quite simple. It, it is go-getters that go and get stuff done, right? The people that don't wait for you to tell them what they do. Uh, our culture and our strategy here actually is to empower the people that are closer to the problem, the people that are closer to the problem are the best people uh, to solve this problem for you, right? Uh, and the, uh, the strategy is to empower these guys uh, and create this uh, loop or feedback cycle that allows us, allows me personally to learn from them and try and give them as much guidance uh, as I can. So the, to the point of talent, this is the, the go-getters that really don't need somebody to tell them what to do. Uh, specifically in a startup uh, kind of an environment, uh, nobody knows the right answer. You're building something that is completely new. So you, got, you kind of have to empower these guys that are closer to the problems. And these guys have to be go-getters. They should not wait for you. Uh, again, to tell them what to do. They have to be extremely fast, uh, uh, extremely execution uh, driven. Uh, at the very start of, an, of any startup, uh, execution, is, execution is key across, but imagine when you have limited amount of cash and limited human resources, uh, you really cannot afford uh, to start dreaming. Right, you have to uh, to stay very focused on the problems you have and uh, execute uh, on them. So execution, executors, is what we want, and uh, this is uh, the kind of caliber uh, we target. Uh, are we hiring now? We're one of the thankfully we're one of the very few companies that are hiring now, since we're selling uh, again people's food at the end of the day. So we cannot afford. Uh, to slow down our operations uh, and we're proud of it. We don't mind it. Uh, it's what keeps us coming to the office uh, every day or come, going uh, to the warehouses and the operations every day to make sure that we're delivering uh, what people need uh, in these times. What is the, the Maxup culture uh, in a little bit, uh, little bit of details? Uh, Basically, I don't want to keep repeating it, but uh, Maxab culture is a culture of execution. It's a culture of getting stuff done. Uh, it's a super open, uh, we have an open door policy. You can walk into any meeting, uh, listen to what your colleagues are saying and uh, pitch in ideas if you really need to. We actually have these open Saturdays. We used to have them when say, things were a little bit smaller when we, when we used to bring uh, talent and uh, people from other startups and companies uh, and engage them in, in discussions as well. So it's a culture that's trying to learn uh, from what people have done. There's uh, a lot of things that are people have done and a lot of people have done it better than uh, what we have, uh, what, what we can think of. So we, tr we try not to reinvent the wheel, right? We try and get whatever is working and build on top of it. Uh, so that's how I think we've been hacking growth so far, is where we start from where everybody else ended. We really don't try and, uh, and reinvent the wheel. We, we, we get creative by improvising on 
uh, what people have ended at, not by restructuring complete solutions. I don't think it's the right approach specifically uh, for startups uh, that are still quite small. Also, this is what actually differentiate, differentiates uh, startups from corporates is, is having an open culture that everyone can uh, pitch in their ideas and speak up and uh, so on. So it's very important for startups to have this culture um, uh, going on. Uh, we have another question. Um, do you have an internal decision-making matrices to guide your culture of execution rather than leaving it as uh, a free for all? Do you have an internal decision making matrices? Uh, yes, so the idea, actually our, our theory is, uh, is very simple. Uh, first of all, you cannot optimize what you cannot measure, right? So we set a way of measuring uh, whatever decision we're going to take and then we take it and figure out did it work or it did not work. We actually encourage experimentation and failure big time. Uh, you do not learn except if you fail uh, and fail quickly. If you're failing quickly, you're learning quickly as well. Uh, and putting the right mesh in place where you can actually measure the impact of uh, what you're testing. So theoretically, uh, just test one thing at a time. Don't test a uh, hundred things at the same time because you actually wouldn't figure out which one of them worked and which one of them did not work, right? So, uh, so that... Uh, that's how I uh, how I think. Uh, interesting. So uh, we know, we have an, another question from Khaled. Um, he's telling you, I want to have the skill to really know if the candidate has the right uh, high talent, and if he or she fits the culture I'm trying to build. How can I achieve and grow such skill when hiring? So Khaled, you're trying to figure out again what kind of talent really fits the culture I'm trying to build and how to achieve and uh, grow such skills within hiring. Well, that's a, that's a good one and a very, very, very uh, tough one because uh, a lot of people uh, actually tend to talk much better than uh, they can actually uh, execute. And uh, figuring this out uh, is not an easy job. It's not an easy job. Uh, and one of the, the ways uh, people uh, tend to hire in the organization, as cliche as it is, but it actually is extremely important, is hiring through referrals. So, so tr I trust uh, the, the judgment of the people I trust, right? So if I trust Farida and she tells me this guy is actually good, which means he executes uh, quite well, uh, then uh, this is one of the very good ways into hacking your way through hiring as well. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I don't know if it's natural to me, but it's, uh, it can actually get quite easy in figuring out uh, who's bullshitting you in an interview and who, who really actually knows their stuff. So if you're, if you're hearing a lot of buzzwords and uh, article titles in terms of uh, in your conversation with a potential candidate, uh, that's definitely a very, very... Uh, a big uh, no, a very big sign that uh, that this is uh, all theory. Uh, ask a little bit about things that have uh, that he've actually done, things that uh, they've executed on, and uh, and then from your answer you have to figure out, uh, and you have to be knowledgeable as well before asking these questions with different cultures, different uh, sorry businesses uh, that these guys are coming from, so that you can actually relate uh, to their point. Um, grow. Okay, we have an, we have questions coming from Facebook. Um, someone is asking you, Ahmed Shafai is asking you, can you hire someone uh, who is super qualified, although you 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 don't have a clear position for uh, for them? Uh, you can do that uh, at the beginning, uh, but not as the company grow. Uh, as you be, at, at the beginning, you you need all the help you uh, you can get and you can put your hands on. Uh, but as you grow uh, and you have an organization in place and you have uh, people's uh, KPIs already in place and you don't want to actually create redundancy because I assuming that the people you've hired are already good, right? So even if there's somebody else that is good uh, and and there will be. Some, uh, some conflict here or some redundancy here, you're, you're wasting a good resource. So a good 
way uh, that, and, uh, that we have started implementing lately and now it's after a year and a half is actually having the KPIs for anybody that's joining the team predefined uh, before he actually joins, right? Uh, if you do not do that at a, at a later stage, it will become problematic because uh, people that are good actually tends to want to do something. And if you really don't have something for them to do, they will leave anyways. So, uh, so actually try and figure out and set their KPIs before they actually join the organization. Okay, we have another one coming from Facebook. Uh, if you were to choose one value for your organization that you believe is the most important, what will it be? Uh, one value? Yeah. It's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, it's a super tough one, but... Uh, uh, I think uh, one of... Uh, one of uh, one of our uh, core values is uh, being genuine to our customs uh, and this uh, implies a lot right so if you are to be so this summarize uh, a lot of the other elements if you are really genuine uh, with the customer you will deliver on time so operations have a part on it uh, if we actually don't deliver on time there's uh, our customer success team will make sure that they resolve uh, the issue really quickly, uh, which also means we will be pricing our products right. So, so this uh, being genuine towards our customers uh, is, I think, one of the values that I uh, I would really care about. Uh, okay, relating to this question, we have another one coming from Yusri El Taher. Uh, he's asking you what are the other uh, core values for uh, Maxab and how did you identify them? Well, so, so pretty much, uh, again, uh, ha, ha, I don't get the, the part of how do we identify the core values. Uh, oh, now I actually get it. So the, the, the values you cannot set from day one and again, write them on the wall to identify your own values. You have to let the operations flow and let the people work and then sit back and try and identify, is this the right thing that I want to do? Uh, what kind of values does this mean? And can I come up with uh, a clear value uh, or a statement that I would come back and communicate uh, to the team and tell them uh, that's the value that I, these are the values that uh, we care about. Uh, so again, uh, being genuine is uh, is one of Maxab uh, core values. Uh, being results driven, extreme and extensively only results driven, uh, uh, is one of uh, our other uh, core values. Um, okay, we have another one coming from. Uh, from Zoom, uh, should one be worried about employee performance? during these times? Uh, so if you've hired the, the, the right people, you, you shouldn't be worried, uh, honestly. Uh, but uh, to be more frank and realistic, yes, you should be worried, not because people are slacking, but again, because of uh, the emotional difficulties that, uh, that the, in this uh, city, the, the, the current situation, the current times have put on all of us. Uh, and that's that's what you really should care about and address with your uh, uh, colleagues at the company. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So we have a, a very tough question from Mahmoud Al Jinzi. He's asking you how to fire an employee and keep the high spirit in the team. Uh, so first of all, uh, let's talk about the pre-firing decision, right? Why, why, why are you firing somebody in the first place? You're firing uh, somebody, there's so many reasons uh, of, of firing people, right? You either really no longer uh, need, this, uh, need this role in general, or people are uh, under, uh, I guessing Gendi is asking about uh, the underperformers uh, and the organizations. Uh, uh, that's the other reason somebody would mainly get fired uh, and how would we uh, fire him is pretty much 
first of all, you have to give him all his chances. And you have to, again, the backs to the previous question, have set KPIs before hiring them. And numbers don't lie, right? If the numbers are not coming, uh, this have a direct impact on the organization and on the colleagues, right? So, and if everybody uh, is agreeing that this is the right matrices and somebody is not delivering on them, then their spirits will definitely not be affected with uh, such a decision, right? Uh, on another note, what ends up happening uh, in organizations that uh, don't fire quite fast is that you, you end up with 10% uh, or 5%, five people in your entire organization doing 80% of the job, right? So you're actually hurting the rest of the team by keeping the bad apples in, in the house, right? Um, so yeah, so that's how we go about uh, our firing decisions here at the company. Uh, okay, we have another one focusing on uh, companies' values. So the question says, uh, do you believe that a company's values change over time? Uh, I, actually, I actually think so. Uh, everything changes over time, right? Nothing, uh, nothing, nothing is permanent. Uh, values would change uh, depending... Uh, I wouldn't say not depending on the situation, depending on the size uh, of the company and what can you actually transcend to the entire teams, right? Uh, so I think they will change because times change and everything changes over time. Uh, a lot of people will disagree with me here, but I think uh, there's not, no shame about it uh, that you change your values. Uh, uh, Lela, I think we've lost you for, for 10 seconds. If you can repeat your answer. Yes, I was just saying that uh, pretty much there is uh, no shame in, uh, in changing your values. It's actually a shame if you figure out that something is not right and you keep it in place, right? Because uh, when you start out, something might uh, seem like it's the right thing and that's the right value to have. And then down the line, uh, they're not, right? So a lot of people will disagree on me with this, but I think values would change over time. Uh, and uh, the problem is if you figured out that you've had this as a value for the company and it hasn't been working out well, uh, just keeping it has no point, just counterproductive. Right, okay, so we have a question from Tiga um, asking what are the tips for managing a large team remotely as a business leader? Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much uh, quite a challenge, I would say, for everybody right now. Uh, but it's quite simple. Just have uh, have frequent, have very frequent touch points, uh, and have very clear KPIs. Uh, by having, you guys don't imagine how having clear KPIs minimize the amount of calls, minimize the amount of effort and follow up you would need to do. Because uh, it's just one number you look at at the end of every week and you would know uh, everybody's performance, right? The other thing is, uh, is have a couple of, uh, of checkpoints uh, periodically. Uh, and uh, one of the other things that I found very useful these times, don't only talk about work, right? The people, uh, like we say in Arabic, فيهم اللي مكفيهم. So uh, they're already... Uh, stressed and uh, full of uncertainties again. So uh, try uh, and, and build this genuine, and build it in a genuine manner uh, with, uh, with your colleagues at the company. Okay, so Tiga has another question. Uh, is it important to still maintain a marketing team during these times, uh, especially when sales are down? Uh, well, that's a question for the wrong person. I really don't believe in marketing to start with. Uh, so I think uh, specifically uh, in my in my field we're in the B two B sector, right? So uh, so marketing uh, and I would say uh, since this competition is about Africa, everybody's here is from the African continent. Uh, I think the uh, in in our content uh, marketing is extremely overhyped uh, and underperforming. Uh, just because uh, the cost of it doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, given that the average GDP per capita uh, in countries uh, like ours is below uh, $2,000 a year, right? So how, how do you justify uh, a customer uh, spending a lot on marketing uh, in these days? Uh, 
uh, if that's the, the the majority of your customers, right, uh, have a GDP per capita of below two thousand dollars, just doesn't make sense, right? It, it makes sense only uh, if your cost of acquisition uh, and the lifetime value is more than whatever you're spending. Uh, but in these days, I would stay focused on keeping afloat and staying alive, right? A lot of uh, companies, unfortunately, will start going down like flies uh, this coming period because a lot of the the past four years have been insane, honestly. Uh, there was a huge hype uh, in, tech, in tech at large, in, uh, in valuations, uh, funding was, uh, uh, was much easier. Uh, so a lot of people were uh, were running after the wrong numbers uh, and now this is the moment now is the time this is the moment of truth where real businesses uh, will show up and uh, you will figure out that they are real businesses and businesses that are, were built mainly on kpis to solve for uh, investors appetite will also show very clearly okay we have one last question coming from sharif Agi. Um, he's asking you, how do you see the transformation of Maxim from a small uh, startup to a corporate that is having different shape now? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, this, uh, this change uh, is uh, inevitable. Uh, the ultimate goal uh, of a startup is to grow the company at the end of, uh, at the, end of the day, right? So what does that mean? Uh, corporates are not usually bad, right? Uh, it's what we know about them now when they become very big, right? And decision making becomes slower are the bad elements of being a corporate. So if you can keep your organization nimble, if decision making still happens uh, quite quickly, then uh, I would love to see my organization grow, right? So that there is nothing uh, wrong about it. Uh, we as uh, and my colleagues at Maxa, we just have to make sure we're evolving, right? So I know for a fact that uh, I'm not the best CEO out there, right? But I'm trying and I have to keep trying uh, to grow uh, my abilities and uh, my skills to better fit uh, the size and the time the organization is at now. So when you're running a small uh, startup uh, differently, definitely, sorry, requires completely different set of skills than managing uh, a big corporate. Uh, I can, we didn't even used to do one-on-ones because we were like five people in a room, right? What kind of one-on-ones would you do, right? But these things, for example, become important and people start appreciating more as the, as the organization grows, right? Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's it on, uh, on that question. Okay, we have uh, two more people asking for advice. So we have one from Facebook and one from Zoom before we close the webinar. Uh, we have one from Khaled, he's saying at the very beginning, we may not have enough fun to hire as many as we may need. What are your suggestions regarding this? Do, do whatever uh, it takes to get the, uh, the best people on board. There is no compromises there, right? To give them sweat equity and they definitely uh, deserve it. Uh, sell them the job, right? Uh, if, I, if you're solving a big problem, Khalid, people will want to be a part uh, of this. They would want to leave an impact. Uh, these these guys are driven, are extremely impact driven, right? They want to see uh, their impact. So put a lot uh, of effort in it uh, and be fair, uh, uh, be generous uh, in, sweat, uh, in sweat equity uh, and sell them the job, right? They will come. Okay, the other one is coming from Ahmed El Hawari. Uh, he's asking for a startup working in the field of online recruitment. How do you advise to start getting their first client? Well, uh, I think uh, yeah, that startup is about the right time, right? A lot of people <laughs> are looking for jobs now. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, usually your first uh, customers won't come from, uh, from your online platform, uh, right? They will come uh, mainly offline. Uh, just pick up the phone and call whoever has registered. Call everybody you know in a company uh, and see who's hiring and how can you make 
uh, that a good fit for them, right? There's no shame about hacking your way uh, offline till you get there, but just uh, but just put the effort in getting it there, even if it's 100% offline. Um, okay, thank you so much, Bilal, for uh, your insights. That was, was really uh, useful. Um, and uh, do you have any closing uh, notes for the, for the attendees? Uh, so I, I just would summarize very quickly, culture is extremely important. It's not what's written on the wall. It's what you guys, uh, what somebody would walk into the office feels. It is uh, what goes through your mind uh, when uh, you're taking decisions. So make sure you have uh, that right. That right. Uh, the right people on the bus, wrong people on the bus very quickly is the other major thing about uh, hiring. Uh, wait uh, for as long as it takes to get uh, your A talent because uh, the Bs will hire Bs and Cs and Ds and that's what uh, you don't want. So keep, uh, stay uh, for as long as you can till you find these uh, A calibers that you really need. Uh, and yeah, these are tough times. Stay strong, guys. Uh, hustle. It's time for uh, for the continent to start hustling. So I wish you guys all the luck uh, in this coming uh, uh, competition. Uh, hopefully you guys uh, all make it somehow. Thank you so much, Bilal. And for everyone who uh, doesn't know about African Entrepreneur Prize, uh, it's a pitch competition for all, for all African uh, entrepreneurs or across Africa for a chance to win a share of one and a half million dollars and uh, to pitch to Jack Ma himself. I'll leave you uh, with a very short video to know how to apply. And thank you so much for tuning in. Um, thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. We see you, African entrepreneur, and now the world needs to see you too. Are you ready to be a 2020 ANPI Africa's business hero? Are you an African entrepreneur? Is your business at least three years old? Are you ready to pitch your business to legends and tell your story? If you said yes to all these questions, it's your turn to apply now. Follow these five quick easy steps to start your journey to becoming an ANPI business hero. Step one, set up an account, fill in your details, click register and you are one step in. Step two, read the guidelines carefully. Just visit africabusinessheroes.org and click on application guide. Step three, the criteria for eligibility. Simple, each applicant should be a founder or co-founder of the company. The applicant has African citizenship or is a direct descendant of an African citizen. Your company has to be registered, headquartered, and operated in an African country. Your company should be at its post-idea stage. Your business should be three years old or more and has at least three years of revenue history. Step four, get a reference. It could be your mentor, colleague, teacher, or advisor. And finally, step five, submit your application. Your application includes these five sections. Founder profile business profile, business deep dive, awards and recognition, and a video introduction. If you get stuck at any point, don't worry. Visit our application guide and frequently ask questions for help or send an email to info at africabusinessheroes.org. Now, it's your turn to become a 2020 ANPI business hero and win a share of $1.5 million. Admission into the Alibaba eFounders Fellowship access to mentorship and training, and a chance to tell your story to Africa and the world. Apply now. Thank you everyone for tuning in. See you next week in the next uh, webinar. Have a good day.